So welcome everyone to Sunday morning at the Marxist Library. My name is Sharon and, and I will be facilitating today. In pre-pandemic times, this weekly program was hosted by the Institute for the Critical Study of Society, ICSS, at the Nebel Proctor Marxist Library in Oakland, California. During the pandemic, ICSS has been meeting digitally on Zoom. When the library reopens for in-person meetings, we intend to continue being online as well, what Zoom calls hybrid meetings, and we're working on the technology for that right now. So we want to say to everyone, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are around the US and around the world. I'm a member of the planning committee that organizes these sessions, maintains the website, icss.org, posts on our YouTube channel, ICSS Marxist, and keeps our financial records. For over a decade, Sunday mornings at the Marxist Library has been a platform for diverse presentations and discussions on political economy, the fight against racism and imperialism, for socialism and about the environment. In short, much needed alternatives to the voices of the corporate capitalist media that surround us. We always welcome your feedback and suggestions. And now I'd like to introduce Laura Wells, who is our speaker today. Laura is a political activist, longtime political activist in California, and has done a lot of work in solidarity with Latin America. She's been an organizer and a candidate for the Green Party and is running against again for state controller in 2022. She also ran for Congress in 2018 and governor after the global financial meltdown in 2010. A, fo a former financial systems analyst, Laura focuses her platform on taxing the rich, public banking, reforming Proposition 13, which is um, a regressive, uh, real estate tax or and saving money and lives with improved Medicare for all healthcare system. And you can see all the Left Unity candidates at leftunityslate.org. And Laura's campaign website, laurawells.org. We've asked Laura to come to speak about the present campaign, the Unity Slate, in the context of what it's going to take to move towards socialism in the United States. And without, without and further ado, I'd like to ask Laura to begin speaking. And after she speaks, we will have a discussion with people raising their hands and, and hopefully um, a lively Q&A and back and forth. Welcome, Laura. Thank you. And it's great to see a lot of people that I know and some that I, that I don't on the screen here. Uh, so basically what I'd like, I, I believe that this discussion about the left unity slate, although it is uh, uh, the left unity slate in California, that a lot of what we will discuss will be both national and international. It will talk, you know, it will address that as well. So I wanted to, basically what I'll talk about is how the left unity slate came about, who's on it, what the values are. Also talk about the odds against the political parties, green and peace and freedom that make up the left unity slate, how the system tries to kill us and the successes that we've had in our survival. Uh, a little bit about electoral reform and what a real democracy might be and uh, what we really need. So I'll start out with the left unity slate. What happened was that uh, at least a year ago, uh, people began to look at the uh, 2020 to the June 2022 elections that were coming up here in California. And what California has is called a top two primary, which means that all parties run together in the primary 
and only two uh, of the candidates, the top two vote getters will go on to November. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later and, and the uh, effect that it has on the third parties. On the, but, but what we decided to do was to cooperate. The Green Party and the Peace and Freedom Party, a bunch of activists got together and thought, why don't we have a slate where we don't compete with each other since our values are so close, including the value of no corporate money. We don't take corporate money so that what we say we believe in is what we believe in at the end of the day. We're not loyal to the billionaires and their corporations. So, and the other values that we have in common, which are justice and peace and the environment and as well as a real democracy. So people started to look for um, candidates, statewide candidates and the statewide candidate, uh, the statewide offices in California include, well, we have two senators like every state um, and there's governor, lieutenant governor, secretary of state, attorney general, two financial positions, one is uh, treasurer and one is controller. And we have the uh, insurance commissioner. And then there's another one, the superintendent of public schools, which is a nonpartisan race. But those are the statewide offices. So the idea was to to identify people in both candidates from both the, the Peace and Freedom Party and the Green Party. And so what we what the people came up with, uh, and, and it, so, so then the slate was arrived at, and then there was the voting process for the Green Party to endorse um, the slate and for the, um, for the peace and freedom. And I, and the slate that, that we arrived at was for Governor Luis J. Javier Rodriguez. <laughs> and he's been, uh, his goals are to close the wealth gap and accentuate eco-friendly actions, demilitarize the police and reform the state prison industrial complex, among other things. Uh, and by the way, I will put links to the, uh, I'll put uh, several links into the chat that where you can look these, look these up, but I'll just give the highlights of them. So that's Luis Rodriguez. And then there's Mohammed Arif, who's with the Peace and Freedom Party, and he's running for Lieutenant Governor. This is one case where the Green Party's uh, Endorsement process was too long, actually it was a late entry, and it was too long for the, for the state Green Party to actually endorse them, too short a period of time. But several county, uh, counties have endorsed from the Green Party and the Peace and Freedom Party statewide has endorsed Mohammed Arif. He's from Kern County, by the way, Luis is from LA County. And he has uh, worked as a legal administrator for law firms, Mohammed, to handle the legal needs of immigrants for many years. Uh, Gary Blenner is with the Green Party, and I'm not sure I mentioned Luis is from the Green Party, Mohammed from Peace and Freedom. Gary Blenner from the Green Party, running for Secretary of State, focusing on proportional representation, ranked choice voting abolishing the California state primaries and um, expanding voting to those of age 16 and older. Then we have the two financial positions which are controller and treasurer. So that I'm running Laura Wells as a green for the controller position, which I run before it's follow the money. If you, if you wanna know what's going on uh, and it has to do with taxing the rich, start with the super rich, and public banking at all levels, state and local, uh, improving the way we use water and, and, uh, and taxes, uh, and divest from our um, prison industrial complex and have jobs that don't destroy the, the environment. 
uh, Megan Adams is the person who's running for treasurer. Basically, the controller is the bookkeeper and the treasurer is the investment uh, part of it. And she's been, she's with the Peace and Freedom Party, Party for Socialism and, and uh, Liberation activist and has been active with the Cancel the Reds and No Cuts to the Classroom campaigns. Uh, transform the military budget, demilitarize the police, put more money into public education. Dan Kapelovitz is a Green who's uh, running for Attorney General. And he's been a criminal, he's, he's worked in civil rights and animal rights law and has been a criminal law specialist in California, a longtime progressive. Natalie Hreesey is Peace and Freedom running for insurance commissioner, and she's run for that before and gotten a great vote result. Uh, and she is uh, totally focused on having a good health care system and actually getting rid of insurance, period. Uh, and the um, and for Senate, we have John Parker, he, who's Peace and Freedom, and he's running for the Senate. Um, he was the um, author of the first Los Angeles $15 minimum wage ballot initiative in 2013. And he's been a coordinator of the Harriet Tubman Center for Social Justice. And so uh, what I'll do is copy, um, well, there's my uh, website, and I'll also copy in three websites for the, well, how, I think those are all clickable, um, and you can save the chat, but um, the leftunityslate.org is a basic, uh, just has, basically has a list of, of the candidates that you can click on their links and get more information on them. It's a bare bones uh, uh, informational place. And then there's, there's uh, something on the California Greens and something on the Peace and Freedom websites that talk about more detail, some of which I've mentioned. Now, the... Um, what I'd like to talk about is how the parties are set up. And this, this is true that uh, within California and across the, the country, what we have here that is called a democracy in the US, and I think that actually to be fair, it was probably the best democracy 200 <laughs> years ago, um, but it has barely been upgraded since. And um, a lot of others, for example, 90 some countries in the world have proportional representation and this country does not. That would make it uh, more of a democracy and a multi-party system as opposed to it's about the most fixed two-party system in the world, which is actually worse than a one-party system because there's this perception that the two parties cover the range of, you know, the political spectrum. Uh, and it's, of course, there, it's, it's not true. Sometimes people say, oh, there's such polarization. And I was thinking, gee, everybody I'm hanging out with says they're just the same. And I started to think of it as a, a if you took a, a circle and you put a line down the middle and the top half has to do with the military industrial complex. It has to do with the corporations and that they're very much the same. The, the other half is the, are the social things, the cultural things, the things that shouldn't even be part of the government's decision. It should be our own decisions that they're they make up as web wedge issues to make it seem as if they're polarized. However, they're very much the same in terms of their um, doing the bidding of the billionaires and their corporations. Now, they, they've been trying, the Peace and Freedom Party has been around since 1967. So that's what, 55 years, if I'm doing the millennial math right? 55, let me, is that true? 
67, 57 years. Okay, that's, that's right, isn't it? It's 55 years. And the Green Party has been around since 1992, which is 30 years. And they, they being the two-party system, has been trying to kill us all this time. And so sometimes people will say, well, why is the Green Party so small? Why is peace and freedom so small? It's like the fact that we are alive is a success. And I think we constantly need to remind ourselves of that. I, I think that to blame the, the Green Party or the Peace and Freedom Party for their weakness is like blaming poor people for their poverty. There's a system out there that requires, you know, that makes uh, us be weak, you know, whether we are the political parties or people in this country. Um, and how do they do it? It's like rules and regulations and the media and propaganda and the rules and regulations are like the two parties, like the, the top two primary. The fact that um, you, that kills, virtually kills us off for the November election in any of the partisan races. Now in California, as in a lot of other places, the local and regional, the county offices are nonpartisan. So your party doesn't appear on the ballot, although most people know who's who. Uh, and the, but the statewide offices, and of course the federal offices are partisan. Um, and so with the uh, top two primary are, has, relates to the partisan offices and all the, of the statewide offices. And they have one of the things, so the rules and regulations, they make the hurdles higher. Every time we sort of get to the hurdle, they make it higher. And the, one, of the, one of the things that's happening at the national level in the Green Party is that uh, Jill Stein from 2016, so that was six years ago at this point, they're um, wanting to fine her um, $170,000 because she used money that was, she, she ended up, Jill Stein ended up qualifying for the public finance small you know, thing that the US presidential campaign has. And they say that she should not have spent some of that money for ballot access. So what does ballot access mean? That means that across the country, all the, the Democratic and the Republican parties are on the ballot automatically, every state. The others are not, whether it's libertarian or green or any other party are not on the ballot. They have to go through and certify in every single state um, in order for them to even appear on the ballot for the voters of that state to vote for. And so of course, um, if you have money in a campaign and you're running for president as a Green Party candidate, you're going to spend some money trying to get on the ballot so that these people can vote for you. And they said that that was uh, not, not, a, not the right use of the money. Um, so that's one of the ways that, that they work on it. I know I was audited. I mean, it did took me weeks and weeks and weeks to respond to that audit. It was supposedly a random audit, you know, that they they automatically audit candidates that get a certain amount of money and then the others they throw in and they randomly pick one. Well, they they didn't end up fining me for anything. They said you should do this a little differently or whatever. But the three, the, but the by the time I ended up and you know giving them all that information, I wish I'd thrown it all away and not and, and not had to deal with it. But it was like a month of prison, you know, where that's what I was focused on. They took me off the streets, you know, for a month focusing on that kind of thing. I wasn't actually going to tell you about that, but it came to mind as to one of the ways that um, that they shut us down. Um, Running for statewide office, I've done that before. And so I know what has happened. It used to be free, essentially. You could get 160 signatures and run for governor or controller or whatever. With 160 signatures, that would wipe out the $3,500 um, fee. Now that went up to 10,000 and then bless them. 
they, it came back down to 4,750 signatures. During a pandemic, the day after the holidays, when some people were getting together this year, um, we were supposed to, you know, in order to wipe that out, that's how many we would need. So we've got several hundred, everybody, but it's still, you have to pay about 3,000. The ballot statements that you see in the voter um, guides that everybody gets across the state, you know, all of the households that have voters in them, uh, used to be free, 250 word statement free. Now, $25 a word. If you were to put in a 250 word statement, that would cost $6,250. And so that plus the 3,500, it's like $10,000 practically that you are sending to California for the privilege of running. Those of us who have heard of public campaign finance, this is a perverse form of reverse public campaign finance. We're financing the state. Um, so I put in a, I do believe in doing a ballot statement. Sometimes we, people on the slate will put in a short one and sometimes a longer one. I put in one for 90 words. And so that was 2000 rather than 6,000, but try to hit it with tax the super rich public banking at all levels, you know, that kind of trying to get some points across for the few people who will read it. So the media, so there are rules and regulations where they try to, you know, ramp up the hurdles every time we get close to being able to do them, but we do them, we do them. Um, the media, uh, again, I've been uh, run enough that I have seen that every single four years, every single election, the media is less and less and less there. And so if you don't hear, and I'm not even just talking about Fox or CNN and MN, M, M, MSNBC, I'm talking about public radio. And I'm talking about even the, you know, the truly public radios like Pacifica, you get less and less and less. You get some at, in Pacifica, but um, even, uh, even NPR, the radio, would have all of the the all of the candidates, um, but they would have the two major candidates in a half an hour, and then the minor candidates in all together in another half hour. And that was but at first they had us all together, you know. So everything is just stamped down, tamped down, tamped down, following along the lines of the the. Uh, Margaret Thatcher, who was a great buddy of Reagan, President Reagan in the 1980s, her thing was Tina, T-I-N-A, there is no alternative. And so they're trying to um, have everybody think that. The prop, uh, pro another media thing is that they do is that they only talk about us if they have the verb spoil in there. Or they will talk about the, like, again, with the Green Party uh, running for president, wedge issues. They'll put us, they'll try to put us on the wrong side of a, a wedge issue, or they'll call, like, for example, Jill Stein again. They called her an anti vaxxer because she said, hey, they ought to be studied more. She's a doctor. You know, they ought to be studied more than they are and not required but of a, not to have a, of the school children have these not tested well enough. Um, barrage of vaccinations and um, anti-cell phones. What, and then she was a Russian asset. Why was she a Russian asset? I think she sat at a table that Putin sat at briefly. Um, and so she was right in there with Tulsi uh, Gabbard. Is that her name? Did I get that right? Um, Russian assets. And so all of that, you know, if you, if, um, over and over and over again, um, not mentioning you in the first place. And when they do mention you, it's always to try to um, turn people away from you. Um, I remember once I, I, I was interviewed and they wanted me to, to say, they wanted me to say that I hoped that the Democrats would lose, that my percentage would cause them to lose. And I actually didn't believe that. And so I didn't say it. And then so he ended up he was interviewing various candidates. He ended up not quoting me at all because I didn't say what he had already written for me to say. Uh, that's how they how they do. Um, that they close the debates. 
Uh, and that's part of the media because the League of Women Voters uh, used to run these things and then they quit because of the um, way that the Democrats and the Republicans were not going to play unless they had it their way. Um, and that was in the, I think the 80s. But um, that, so they closed the debates. So who can hear from us? Uh, and the propaganda. Uh, 2000, in this millennium, since the year 2000, the United States of America, this great country that in lots of ways, it's a great land, that's for sure. The, but this great democracy that's gonna spread democracy around the world has had two presidents, two people take the office of the president without getting the popular vote. And that was Bush in 2000 and Trump in 2016. Not, they were not voted in, they got in. One of them, of course, was elected by the um, Supreme Court. But, the, but what they, how they used that was, there is now a term called do a nader, which is what Bernie decided not to do. He didn't, wasn't going to do a nader. So he ran with the Democratic Party. And I wonder if there's going to be a phrase. I mean, thank goodness, Bernie Sanders brought socialism out of the closet and into the lexicon where people are talking about it and it's not used as a bad word. Um, so Bernie did, you know, did us a great service in that way. But is it a do a Bernie now when you decide to go with one of the major parties and they find some way or another to, to wipe you out, not just in 2016, but also in 2020? Um, but they, and, but the, the thing that they hang around our necks more than anything is can't win, can't win can't win. Uh, and so why vote for us, even if you believe in us, you know, if we can't win, you know. So even when there's ranked choice voting, the way the voters' minds seem to work is that they look at who are the people who can win, and then they rank among there. They don't do what we're trying to say, hey, vote your values, number one. You know, there's no loss and there's much, get much to gain by doing that. But um, they go, well, you know, they can't win. Um, and what, and it isn't really, if it were just that the Green Party couldn't win or that the Peace and Freedom Party couldn't win, but what they're really saying is you can't win. Do you know, people can't win. That's what the can't win thing means. It, it doesn't have to do with just the, the political parties. It's Tina, there is no alternative. So, um, but how, well, how have we been successful? How come we've survived? We've 55 years and 30 years and they can't kill us. Um, for one thing, I think we come up with the left unity slate. We come up with ways to keep going, to keep surviving, to cooperate. Plus we have the values that people actually want, which is that, you know, peace, right there in the name, peace and freedom. Green, you know, the environment right there in the name and real justice and real democracy. Plus, as I said, we do not take corporate money. And so I'm glad to say that there are other candidates who are doing that. However, it's not quite the same when you, when you as a candidate don't, don't take it and your party as a whole does take it. You know, we are both the party and, and the candidate, the group of candidates do not take uh, corporate money. So we've have committed people um, who have been willing to jump the, ready, willing and able to jump the hurdles or sometimes it would crawl over the hurdles, but get past them. And, and it reminds me of the phrase that where they say that it, if it, what doesn't kill you makes you strong. And it's almost like these things have made us determined to stay. Um, so, uh, and also we do run for president. Why? People say, why do, you know, the people come up to me and it's like, they've just thought of this. You know, Laura, you know what I think? I think the Green Party ought to start local and then build up. You know, it's like, okay. Yeah, like the Republicans did with the school boards. Okay, yeah, with a billion dollars, yeah, we could do it. But what they do, what people do not realize is they fight us as hard at the local level as they do at the national level. 
they also do not realize that we have to run national in order to keep our names alive. And in order for, you know, Green Party is a national party, in order to um, get, get the other parties to stay alive, you have to run um, a, a president or else it won't work. Um, and then they blame you for doing what you have to do, which is a lot like, um, again, the analogy of uh, poor people. Why, why, why are poor people poor? Well, look, poor people make mistakes. Greens make mistakes. Peace and freedom, we do make mistakes, but it's the system, do you know? Um, that's what keeps us uh, where, where we are. But let's see. Um, and I was thinking about Green Party and Peace and Freedom. We have different strengths. Um, the Green Party is national and international. Peace and Freedom is mostly a lot in California and some other states. The Peace and Freedom has the Party for Socialism and Liberation, has a strong street presence, you know, movement, rallies, and things like that. Been around a little longer than the Green Party. Um, and the Green Party has had more people elected. We've been more focused on elections and things like that. But we, but we're, we both have somewhat different strengths. And yet, as I said about the, the values and the fact that we're willing to cooperate with each other. Sometimes people, often people have said to me at the same time that they say, why don't you run local and build up? Because they kill us off locally. But also they'd say, why don't all the small parties run together? And you gotta go, well, uh, libertarians, basically, if you take don't tax and let everybody do everything they want with their private property, that, you know, that pretty much is what they base the libertarian party on, and that's not us. And the, uh, the American Independent Party, which is the largest third party by voter registration in California, not because people agree with George Wallace, who's, who was one of the founders of the party and, and who did it to fight integration, but because they see, well, I'm American and I'm independent and a lot of people are registered American Independent Party because they think it means independent. Um, and so that's Libertarian American Independent Party, but you have the Green Party and the Peace and Freedom Party. Why don't we run together? Okay, so we are. And I've, I've heard a lot of people um, are, are really receptive to the idea, really like the idea that we're doing this. Um, and I'm happy to, I'm ex very excited myself, and, but the reception has been very good, I think. Um, now, what electoral reform, how am I doing on time? Doing okay, 1108. Um, and I'm really looking forward to our discussion and, and Q and A. Uh, but what the electoral reform? I want to talk about that. I've talked about what some of the problems are. People really want electoral reform, and so what the oligarchy, <laughs> the power of the few, have put together is that then they they put out these um, electoral reform initiatives and things like that. And people vote for them, uh, like they voted for the top two primary. Why? It was sold by, well, let's see. I think the description at the time was uh, the, the Attorney General of California is responsible for making sure that the description of the initiatives is good. And Jerry Brown in t was, uh, the attorney general, and he said something like it, in, it increases, it will, the, the ballot description was an open primary system where, which will increase people's ability to participate in the elections, you know, because it was an open primary. No, it's a top two. And in November to this day, people don't realize that the parties have disappeared from, no, from the November general election. They, they don't realize what the top two primary has done. They don't realize that in the top two primary, vote for the Greens and the Peace and Freedom Party. Do you know there's nothing to lose? I mean, there's nothing to lose or vote your values anytime, I think. But even if you're afraid, you know, if you buy the fear, you know, but most people don't even vote in the primary. So it's a, it's a huge challenge. I was going to say, um, the, I mentioned, I listed the parties already and 
what they, uh, where's the, I wanna give you some of the statistics about the um, numbers the, of, re, of registrants. The, there are 27 million people in California, the nation state of California that are eligible. Of those 22 million are registered. So about 5 million are not registered that are eligible. The Democrats have about 47%, the Republicans 24%. I'll put a link in the chat that shows that, that that's that's uh, where you can get to the um, to a chart, a spreadsheet of these figures. American Independent has 3.4 percent. As I said, that's a lot of people think that they're they're registering independent. Uh, Libertarian has about one percent. Peace and Freedom now 0.53 percent, which is. Uh, 150, uh, close to 116,000, which is great. Green Party, 0.42%, which is about 91,000. But the numbers have been going up a little bit lately. One of the good things about the numbers for peace and freedom is an indication of how socialism is taking hold more than it, than it ever was before. And that's great to see. No party preference which they keep changing. It used to be declined to state. It used to be independent, whatever. No party preference, 23%. So almost a quarter of them uh, of our um, could be uh, registrants are no party preference. One of the things that the two party system has done a good job of is um, making people hate political parties. And they, um, uh, and they, so they, so they, people generalize it and then they hate all political parties. But what we really need for electoral reform, the great big PR, proportional representation. That is what makes uh, a multi, multi party system. And the simplest explanation of, of proportional representation that I've heard is to take an example of. Oh my goodness, do I have a call coming in from Sharon Rose? Is that, was that intentional? Hold on, hold, hold on just a sec. Sharon? Hi, Jean. You are muted, uh, uh, Laura. Oh, just a minute. Okay, yeah. the host unmuted open. me. Thank you, host. Um, so the proportional representation, you take a district that has five people in it. And the way that we have it right now is what's called first past the post. And so in the Central Valley, basically you're gonna get all Republicans because they have maybe a slight edge or maybe a big edge, you know, but at 51%, they get that, you know, 50.1%, they get that, then they get the whole seat and the other 49% are not represented. In uh, San Francisco, it'll be the opposite. It'll be all Democrats. Um, when you have a five person district, if you have 20% of them, want peace and freedom, then you get one of those five seats. If 20% want green, then we get one of those five seats. So that's two. And let's say that there are two Democrats and one Republican. Then you have a multi-party system. And Illinois for a long time had proportional representation. And even the partisans, the people from the different political parties liked it better then they then um, then without proportional representation because you could actually get into the issues you could work things through you would have to work things through 
Um, and so the, but proportional representation, that's like uh, an example was given that after Fukushima, the nuclear uh, plant meltdown in Japan, Germany was gonna go business as usual with their nuclear power plants, but they have a multi-party system, proportional representation and the greens got a bunch of votes. And they went, oh, okay. And they listened to that and stopped their nuclear um, power plants uh, because they had the greens could make uh, a strong statement. And so, um, so we need that. We also, there's a bunch of others. I mean, <laughs> voting on a Tuesday, give me a break. Uh, and you know, the other, other countries vote on the weekends. You can have, Every county has a different voting system in this country. We could um, standardize it. It could be computerized with a paper ballot. You know, you can do that. Venezuela has a wonderful electoral system, which is, um, of course, ironic that then they're called their their elections are always alleged to be fraudulent by the um, U.S. and its cohorts. But they have fingerprint paper ballot that you can look at, you put it in a separate place, the computer adds it all up, you know, you can't even audit in our uh, country um, of a vote because it's so, um, how many counties is 50,000 or, you know, some tens of thousands of counties and they all have a little different system. Um, we've, there, you know, there are a number of other things we could do, I mentioned, um, we could vote on the weekends, you know, we could have open debates, we could have, pu we could have public campaign finance, we could do all of those, but really proportional representation is the gold standard for, um, it's, it's the, what, would, what is really needed. Then even if we didn't have as much money as, as the others, we could get more, we could get the votes because of our values, because we would be there and the media would, um, you know, have to, you know, and we, it, we'd get, it would change everything. So, um, but what we, I'm going to close up uh, the presentation part by saying that Oh, here's something that I, I wanted to say. Voter registration matters. Everybody who's on there, with what here, there's 30 people on this. I am hoping that every single one of you, and I know not, not all of you are in California, but I'm hoping that every single one of you is registered either green or peace and freedom. Um, it's because the voter registration does matter. It helps to keep us strong and keep us alive and vital. Votes do matter. If it's a foregone conclusion, who's going to win, then don't, don't encourage the Democrats and the Republicans in their um, wrongheaded, militaristic, um, people squashing ways. Uh, so as, as our actions matter, and that's what I'm going to close with, and that is that what we really, 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 really need in this country, and who, and, and it's not that easy to figure out how it's going to happen, is a huge movement of people. We need the people to recognize what's happened and uh, you know what's happening to their lives and to recognize that we have more power than we think we do. Um, and to use that power to take to the streets, to use our wallet power, to, to go for mom and pop shops and not the big corporations to, even if it costs a little bit more money um, and to, um, and, and when there, there are rallies, you know, call them protests, call them demonstrations, whatever, rallies, it, it, get together, um, organize together, that kind of thing. We need that. And the, the powers uh, of, in our culture and in our laws are so much against that. Um, even the public spaces, the libraries, you know, aren't open as long as they should be. The common spaces have, you know, there's, you, there are more and more park fees and, you know, all of that stuff. But um, that's what we really need. And so I'm glad 
this year that the left unity slate re represents a step in the direction of people coming together, two political parties coming together, cooperating, maintaining our unique identities and our and our unique uh, you know focuses and differences, diversity, but um, staying together. So with that, uh, I'm closing out at 11:20. Looking forward to the discussion. Um, thank you so much, Laura. Um, Mehmet, can you let me turn on my video? Um, uh, I, yes, I will. I will turn everybody's. Uh, uh, please, yes, you now have the have the choice to. Yes, thank there you. you go. Thank you. So uh, I apologize. Um, power went out briefly in our neighborhood, and I lost. The connection. I think Alan is in the same boat, and actually, I don't. I don't know. He may be in the waiting room, Emmett. No, he sure. he came in also. Yeah, oh, he oh, said he's he here now. Okay, great. Um, so I apologize for that disruption. Um, what we want to do is just briefly pause to have Jean Rule talk about upcoming programs and Richard Fallenbaum talk about finances. Jean, are you ready to share? Uh, I think so. Am I ready? You're yes, on. You are. <clears throat> okay. Well, thank you, Laura. Th that was a great presentation. And as a former Peace and Freedom candidate, I certainly feel your pain. So <laughs> uh, th that was great. Um, and as for upcoming programs, we have some good programs coming up. And one is coming up next week is the United Front History, Applications, and Prospects. And um, actually, this is uh, um, a young Turk coming in to speak to us, a friend of Mehmet. So do you want to say anything about that, Mehmet? Uh, uh, he's a, he's a, a PhD uh, a, a graduate from Berkeley on sociology. And he's going to be talking about the, as you said, the United <laughs> Front. Uh, what it is, what it is not, uh, how people, uh, of course, we are leftists, so we interpret things in um, thousands of ways, uh, how United Front is being interpreted by different uh, leftists and how it differs from the popular front and its, uh, its uh, adaptations, where has it been adapted, uh, how successfully not, and why we need it today. I think that's where he's going to hit hard on where, why we need it today. So that's next week. Thank you. Okay. Um, and then following that, uh, the next week, May 1st, um, I'll be talking actually on the abolition of war, anthropological perspectives. And this may not seem like the appropriate time to talk about the abolition of war, um, given what's going on, but I think it is. And I start with uh, the recognition that war is not an individual, is not so much between individuals as between states. And then we look at Engels, who said that uh, the society which organizes production anew on the basis of free and equal association of the producers will put the whole state machinery where it will then belong into the Museum of Antiquities, next to the spinning wheel and the bronze axe. So um, that, that's the official Marxist position. So I'll be talking about that appropriately on May 1st. So back to uh, Richard, I think. Thank you, Gene. Go ahead, Richard. Thank, thank you, Gene. Um, I just want to talk briefly about finances. As you know, we, we, as most of you know, we continue to need funds for both to help the library, the Nebel Proctor Marxist Library in Oakland, and to finance our own activities, uh, which is putting on, mostly putting on this weekly forum, which has not been, been going on for well over five years. Um, and um, we're, we're trying to upgrade the technical aspects of that, and that's going to cost us some money. So I put in the chat some information on how you can contribute. We especially welcome 
modest, regular contributions, monthly contributions, which are now pretty easy to do through painlessly, at least in terms of time, um, through your bank or your payment system. <clears throat> anyway, there's information there. If you missed the chat, it's also on the email that you received for this meeting. And it's also on our website, icssmarks.org. There's a, there's a contribute button. So with that, I'll return to Sharon. Thank you. So thank you, Laura. And this is gonna be an interesting discussion for sure. So I see four people on the queue at the moment, Janet followed by Richard W, then Jean, and then Yusuf. Janet, please go ahead. Uh, you have to unmute yourself, Janet. Go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, good. Uh, so, Laura, thank you. Uh, very good presentation. So, I have two questions. One, um, if someone were to uh, choose between the Green Party and the Peace and Freedom Party, would you describe from your point of view the difference between them in terms of their positions on issues, uh, not strengths and weaknesses, but their, the actual positions? Uh, and my second question is, can you describe how the Green Party is organized internally? Why don't I take a few questions and then... Uh, okay, if you prefer that. Or, well, let's see. A, a lot of times it's, it's um, questions and comments. Yes. Um, so I'll, I'll go with this one, although they're huge questions. Um, and, but I think that... Uh, so, so, you, so I already mentioned the strengths and, weak, strengths and weaknesses as I see them, and you, you didn't want that. You wanted the positions... And, and the internal um, organizing. Uh, one of the things that I wish, I'll talk about the last thing. One of the things that I wish that we did in the Green Party that Peace and Freedom does do is that they have majority rule. Um, and the Green Party, I think it's fine. A friend of mine probably 20 years ago said that she thought that the Green Party should have as a goal consensus, but that they should back up to majority rule as opposed, as opposed to what the Green Party does, which is to back up to um, super majority rule, which is like two thirds. And in some cases it had been 80%, which we knocked down. And some cases we got down to 60% and stuff like that. But I think that, um, so that's that, that actually, as I think Kevin Aiken from the Peace and Freedom Party um, said that, that that empowers minority opinions, but it disempowers majority opinions. Um, and, and I agree. So that's one of the, one of the in, internal struggles within the Green Party. Um, the Green Party's national and international Peace and Freedom Party is here mostly in California, and I think in another, they had ballot access in, in at least one other state, I don't remember which one, for the presidential primary. The um, Green Party in its name it makes people think it's just about the environment, and it's not. It's also about justice and peace and democracy, um, but it's known as uh, environmental more than peace and freedom. Peace and freedom has been socialist, as I mentioned from the beginning, which has an, an, an enormous um, appeal now. Well, I hope it's growing to enormous, but a bigger and bigger appeal, especially among young people, which is great. And, and Green Party now is eco-socialist. So, so I know that um, sometimes peace and freedom teases the Green Party a little bit for not going like all the way with socialism, but, um, you know, that's a hard question. Um, and it's without an, you know, a, uh, an easy answer and, and certainly not from one person, me. <laughs> so, but thank you for the questions. Thank you. Uh, Richard W, you're next. Please unmute. Yeah. Oh, 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 okay. 
Um, I'm not going to dance like I promised you. Sorry. Um, but I will ask annoying questions. <laughs> See, you'll, get, you'll get half of it. <laughs> um, first off, uh, I, I grew up in Maine, and I'm, I'm happy to say that Maine has implemented ranked choice uh, uh, voting. I think it's too early to tell how how effective it is at this point. I mean, it's only been in, in effect in, you know, for about a year or two now. Um, so I'm kind of curious a little bit more, if you could say a little bit more about that. Uh, the other th couple of points I had here was, what are the, how is this, a, how is your presentation? How is your, uh, how is it applicable to other states? Uh, one, I mean, like I'm down here in Texas. How is it applicable to me down here? Uh, and the other, uh, the other question I had, or uh, one of the other questions I had was, it seems to me that you're um, that you're you've adopted a, a model that was maybe have was true back in the '60s and '70s, and that is of chasing the media. Um, I would like to know if you are getting away from that. In other words. Are there any tactics that would involve bringing the media to you? Uh, and in particular, you know, with, with the new uh, uh, electronic uh, uh, stuff, are you using that at all? Um, and I'll stop it there. I had another question about the independent uh, non-voters. I'll save that for later. Thank you. Okay, I'll say something about that. Um, and I also meant to say, in answer to Janet's question, one of the things that has happened in, in California with uh, is that people trade back and forth, green and peace and freedom. That there's been a lot of that back and forth. And it has to do with uh, like with whether or not one of the parties might be in danger of losing ballot status or in the process of regaining ballot status, which has happened. And so people have gone uh, back and forth. Right now, we're both, you, you need to hit a couple of marks. One of them is uh, five, two percent, two percent in a statewide race. And the other is you have to have a certain level of uh, voter registrations. And we're both good for the next few years. Um, and, and undoubtedly, we'll my guess, my, I would put money on the fact that we'll get two percent um, in, in the June 22nd. June 2022 um, primaries. So that was uh, a leftover remark from the prior question. Um, so ranked choice voting, that's one of the reasons, Richard, why I said um, that people still seem to look at in the, when they look at the list of candidates, they go, who can win? And they knock, and they do not consider voting for the ones that can't win. So even when it's ranked choice voting, where what we try to, to tell people is please, you know, rank number one. And if there's, you know, like you can rank number three, like if it were a presidential election, you know, rank, uh, rank the green peace and freedom, rank them first. And then if you prefer the Democrat, then vote the Democrat third, you know, it will help, it won't hurt. But people don't think that way. Um, and they haven't been educated to think that way by our wonderful media, which was um, another uh, question. Oh, one of the effects that one of the good things, that California, sometimes things start here and then get spread. And so one of the good things that happened in California or that did not get spread from California was the top two primary. I remember at the time, a friend of mine in Florida said, California is going top two and we're going to spread it across the nation, you know, and so they were already trying to do it in Florida. We did talk to later uh, Washington, the state of Washington had it before us, and then California did the dumb thing um, because it, voter approval was going down, 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 but not fast enough. People didn't understand it uh, soon enough, and it was, so it was going down. But the but the election came when it was when it hadn't dipped below fifty percent. Arizona had it on the ballot. And um, I know that I was on a uh, radio interview or talking about why they should not do it and stuff like that. So, um, and the whole two party system, uh, 
across this country has a huge effect everywhere. You know, and and uh, so anything that that I mentioned about the two party system or there is no alternative or, you know, electoral reform and stuff like that, that that has to do with the, across all of the states. Um, vote your values, register your values, the registration thing, just look for every, who cares if it's not going to change the world. Every little bit of power that we have, especially something that's as easy. You know, I wish I, you know, could say this to like the whole world. Can I, can I interrupt you for a second, Laura? Sure, sure. Uh, we keep talking about a two-party system. In point of fact, even in Congress, we really have a, a tripartite, maybe even a quattro. You know, I mean, you have Bernie, who is an independent. So it's no longer right to talk about a, bi a bipartisan uh, Congress. We're really a multi-partisan Congress. And we need to start addressing that. We need to start bringing that to the front and making people aware that there already is a multi-party system out there. So I'll, I'm, I'm sorry, I just, my, my okay. comment. As a, as a way for people to think that's not a strange thing, it, in a way it already exists, let's expand it, yeah. Um, chasing the media, There's a, there are a lot of, um, you know, we put out press releases mostly so that we can put them on our website um, statements and things like that. The, uh, there are a lot of people doing podcasts, a lot of people doing, you know, like community radio and things like that, that reach in and want to do interviews and things like that. So we're doing, um, you know, and there's social media and all of that. So people, so the Greens and I'm sure the Peace and Freedom are, are doing those things as much as, as we can. It, it doesn't, take away from the fact that a whole lot of people get their information from the mainstream media, radio, TV, and that mainstream includes what they think of as the ultra liberal public radio and all of that stuff, you know, NPR and PBS, which is down the line, especially when you look at foreign policy, down the line, wrong, lies, you know, it's, uh, and yet people think that there's right wing, you know, Fox and there's left wing CNN and them and, and, you know, give me a break. But any, yeah, we do, what we, we try whatever we can do. Okay, um, please put down your hand when, after you speak, you've spoken so I can keep track of the stack. So Jean is next, followed by Yusuf, Nina, Richard F., Richard Kit, and Susan. Go ahead, Jean. Oh, okay, well, th uh, thank you, Laura. This was great, uh, as expected. Um, and I have to say that when I left Long Beach, I was uh, uh, part of the Long Beach chapter, Peace and Freedom. And that was a very good period. But when I came, moved to Oakland, uh, you were one of the major founder, uh, finds that I found up here that you have a very creative uh, approach to politics, even though you're a green person. Um, but um, I really appreciated some of your terminology. For example, you describe the Democrats and Republicans, not simply as the major parties or big parties, you describe them as the titanic parties, titanic both in the sense of their sheer size and also the fact that they are leading us straight into disaster. So I, I like that approach and that was good. Um, but I also wanted to remark on something the Green Party does because there's all this, the Democrats and Republicans are saying, oh, we need to have, um, uh, a, a national law, what is it, the, the Right to Vote Act, which uh, will guarantee everybody has the right to, has ballot access and so on. Um, but what they don't say is if you look at this, and the Green Party, I have to say, are the only people that has an analysis of that uh, major uh, piece of legislation. And they point out, yes, it will guarantee everybody the right to vote irrespective of race, religion, color, et cetera, et cetera, but it will only guarantee their right to vote Democrat or Republican. It will effectively give the 
third parties such as Greens and Peace and Freedom even less power than it has now. So I, and I, I think the Greens did a very good analysis of that. I think it's on their webpage, uh, but I'd like you to comment on that. And the other thing I want to say is that um, people have commented about our democracy. And I just want to stress, it's not our democracy. It's their democracy. It's a dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. And we need to understand that. So, but uh, again, thank you. And uh, if you could say more about uh, the Right to Vote Act or whatever it is. Um, yeah, the, I, I don't remember the exact details and you may, you may have them more than I do on, the, um, on what it did, but it, it, it raised the, the bar, it, it increased the hurdles in some way where we either had to raise more I think it was that we had to, in order to qualify for public funding or whatever, that we had to raise more money in more states, a higher percentage. We had to get a, you know, more signatures, more whatever. You know, it was that we being the the non Titanic parties and um, that it just raised the hurdles. But I honestly don't remember what the what the exact. Um, uh, hurdle was that they raised up. But I do want to say about Titanic, I meant to mention that I think rather than top two primary, it should be called the Titanic primary. It's like, which of the Titanics are you going to take a cruise on in November? Do you know, it's like they're, they're, they're cap, their leaders are heading straight for the iceberg, promising everybody lots of fun and dancing, which is great. But, um, and and heading straight for the iceberg and not turning aside. So, um, so yeah. I just want to say about, about the, um, the uh, other feature of that bill is that it effectively eliminates any con campaign contributions to the Titanic parties. So instead of having 5,000 limits, campaign limit, it's like $5 million, which yeah. uh, yeah. Greens aren't likely to get that kind of contributions. Right, so I think that they, they did something to make it easier for the Titanics and harder for the lifeboats. Right, absolutely. Which is what we are. Yeah. Oh, and the lifeboats. Yeah, so the analogy is that come aboard the lifeboat, the more people on it, the bigger it is. You know, it gets bigger when the, you know, it doesn't sink, it gets bigger. Yeah, the other thing is people always ask us, are you a serious candidate or are you just running on the issues? Yeah. I meant to mention that you actually have to, you know, I, my philosophy of running for a campaign is to focus on one or two key things. You have to say the laundry list so that people know that you're on their side, but one or two key things. And so I've done public banking and tax the rich, tax the rich and public banking. Um, and you sort of have to play it straight. You have to, is you have to uh, like one time, um, well, I'll tell this little story that we, uh, I was running for governor and there were also um, people running as, as peace and freedom and uh, libertarian and American independent party. And so this afternoon talk show in San Francisco um, said, well, now we're going to invite the, the governor candidates from the other parties, you know, we're going to be really open about this. And the, and so three out of four of us were there and they said, okay, they, they gave us three, they said, here's what we're going to, what you're going to do. They sat us on like these bar stool kinds of things. So there's the three of us sitting on these tall stools and they would ask us questions. And one, and, and, and one of the questions was this, um, now you weren't in the debates. That is a matter of fact, I was arrested outside the debate just because I wanted to get into the audience. This was in 2010, where it was Jerry Jester Brown and Mega Bucks Whitman who were um, on there, not talking about anything except he said, she said, you know. Um, so I was, somebody gave me a ticket and I was just trying to get in and they arrested me. Um, and so, but you weren't, you weren't in the debate what would you have said if you were in there? You have 30 seconds. 
<laughs> which was a laugh. I mean, you just, but you have to play it straight. You can't spend your 30 seconds saying, well, I need more time. You know, so it's just like public banking, invest in California, not Wall Street, establish them at the state level and at the local level and invest and partner with the community banks and make good loans to homeowners, small businesses and students, you know, so you have to boom, say it. Um, you, you have to look the part to some extent, you know, as much as you can. Um, dress, you know, when you're, you know, when you're someplace, dress as if you're, you know, a candidate, you know, that kind of thing. Is it more important that that I wear the clothes that I like to wear, or is it more important that I don't put something in the way between what I'm trying to say and and people's ears? Do you know? So anyway, that's. Well, thank you, Laura. I was there when you were arrested and watched it. Uh, so anyway, great job. Thanks. Thanks. OK, um, next is Yusuf. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, so um, uh, uh, my question is here in Connecticut. We don't have a rec rank choice voting, but um, other parties could endorse uh, other parties' candidates, provide they, um, they, they get some uh, a certain percentage of votes on their own. Um, I, I forget what it's called. Fusion, maybe? Uh, well, or that's a different thing. We, 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 well, the principal um, uh, other party is uh, uh, the Working Families Parties, and it endorses or does not endorse candidate, usually uh, from the Democratic Party, uh, and occasionally uh, runs its own uh, uh, candidates. Uh, so uh, that's what it is. I forget what it's called. Right. Uh, um, so I'd like your opinion on that. Second, I don't think not only one needs a proportional representation, one really needs more uh, power to the legislatures rather than the executives, and particularly the uh, 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 the House of Representatives uh, rather than the uh, uh, Senate. So I think that should be a uh, a demand and I, uh, an important uh, demand, um, because um, even if you have proportional representation, doesn't mean much if uh, the legislature uh, doesn't have uh, substantial power. Uh, so uh, uh, I'd like your opinion on that. I'm, I'm, uh, I have another question for the second round. Okay, I totally agree that um, the legislatures need to be, um, have more power than the, the executive has too much power in this country. I don't think there should be anybody that's president of the United States that has that much power. There's nobody I don't think that can handle that much power. Um, and it's, and to be the, uh, you know, to wield that power the way the U.S. has, no matter who's been president, is is just a, a civic crime. So definitely the legislatures, definitely it should be proportional. It's insane to have Wyoming and Delaware have two senators and, uh, along with California and to have our presidential electoral college reflect that same imbalance. As to the working families party. Um, what has happened with any party that tries to, um, that, that uh, cozies up to the Democratic Party is that they get nullified, you know, they get subsumed. And so the, and, and, the, and the, there are enough Democratic Party loyalists to go into organizations, um, like even great organizations with great uh, values like, you know, I'm thinking DSA, which is not a political party, but um, that we had a speaker here at ICSS, at which I really remember how he said, yes, go there, you know, and talk to people and, and, and all of that, but don't expect to take over the leadership. And so, uh, because the Democratic Party has the resources to 
do that. And so the problem with uh, the, like the Green Party does not in the Green Party does not endorse Democrats in partisan races um, or Republicans. And the um, but but the local counties do um, it, whether it's endorse or recommend um, de Democrats for local office and the nonpartisan offices and things like that. Um, but uh, it's 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 a way. It's like where it's some you know people say the Democratic Party is where movements go to die. Uh, you know, once they take it over, I'm, I'm going to speak for a couple of minutes at Earth Day, at San Francisco Earth Day, um, next Saturday, um, in the 1 p.m. time slot. Um, and the Earth Day has been co-opted so much. I mean, from the very beginning, they they tried to make the environmental movement into an anti-litter campaign. Um, and it wasn't that it was, uh, it's much stronger than that. So, so it's just, it's, uh, yeah, I think the Working Families Party gets weakened by its connection to the Democratic Party. That's what I think. Okay. Um, there is a name for that process where you can vote for a candidate on more than one line, uh, but it has to be enacted at the state level. And in California, I believe it, that was tried and it failed to, to become a process here in the state. And I knew some people who were trying to get it done nationally, but then it appeared that they would need a constitutional amendment. And anyway, that failed a few, about a decade and a half ago. But, um, next on the stack is Nina. Nina, please unmute yourself. Nina, are you there? Okay, we'll come back to Nina. Richard Fallenbaum is next. You know, I just um, a comment, a couple of comments. Uh, I think it was Engels who said that in a bourgeois dictatorship, uh, elections don't change anything, but uh, we recognize that elections don't really change anything, but the um, they're useful to as a gauge for the the, the uh, masses' sense uh, consciousness. Um, um, I think there there are millions of people who uh, tens of millions of people like like the twenty three percent registered independent, maybe who who are totally alienated from the system. Uh, the whole system, the whole political system and the economic system. And I think that the function of the, the and, 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 the, and many of them, most of them are on the left, some of them are on the right, they're all over the place. But I think uh, candidates need to express that opinion. I, I've, um, I've, um, I've argued that um, the, the left candidates are too nice. Um, you know, I think one of the lessons from Trump is and why he was successful is attack. There has to be a attack all the time. You always have to be, in the, and I've said this before to you, Laura, and I, it, I don't think it's completely sunk in. Um, you, you need to be attacking, attacking. When you're on a TV station and they're giving you shit, you need to attack the TV station. You have, you have to Show, show that they're, they're corrupt part of the uh, media dictatorship. When, when, you're, when you're talking about the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, these are corrupt, vicious parties. And that system is corrupt and vicious. And that's, that, you have a slight chance then of mobilizing these millions of people who re refuse to participate in the political system to vote. But I think getting into the weeds of all these issues, uh, like ranked choice voting and all that stuff, is my, I'm just bored with it. I'm not interested in it myself. Uh, and I don't think anybody else is. Um, right, you know, that's, I think you have to talk about how corrupt the system is uh, and um, all the time and keep attacking them. And whenever you get a chance to attack them, the, 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 and of course, this was the same problem with Bernie Sanders, 
you know, he refused to attack the Democrats. So he he became a Democrat, basically. And if you don't really attack him whenever you have the opportunity, it's, it's it's a waste of time. It's a waste of effort, in my view. Thank you. Okay, I do have a comment. Um, and I, I think you're right in some sense. Um, and uh, something that I need to remember, that I want to remember, is that when I talk about the Democratic Party, particularly when I'm talking to people that they're, they're Democrats in the um, audience of the radio or in the room, um, is that I wanna to remember to say the Democratic Party leadership so that people don't identify with what I'm attacking, if I'm attacking, that that they don't think that I'm attacking them. See, that's the problem. And and my my way, right or wrong, um, uh, I am hearing what you're saying, Richard. Uh, And I think there's some truth in there that I need to learn. But it seems that, you know, among the ways that we're all different is that whatever, middle child, I don't know what, you know, but my deal is building bridges. You know, it's it's trying to, I don't know, some some of you here got my last blog, but it but it was starting out just saying that, you know, trying to not say, you don't know the truth, you know, but to say <laughs> how it's been set up that we don't know the truth, you know, to try to create a bridge seems to be more my way, but I will, um, I, I, I do need to, you know, it's, yeah, I'll just need to remember to say the Democratic Party leadership, you know, it's, a, it's not every Democrat, you know, they, they just bought into the fear, over. Thank you. Um, Nina, you're next. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, um, well, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm so thankful uh, to you, Laura, for uh, talking about democracy. And um, uh, the problem uh, I would see here uh, that I've mentioned uh, at times, uh, this group here uh, is not democratic in that they took over that's uh, i guess sharon raj and and some others and they and we they weren't elected to be on the program committee or to decide anything about this group and so that i have a hard time i shouldn't say a hard time but uh, i'm not surprised because uh, how should i say the history of some of the left hasn't been too democratic but I think the Peace and Freedom Party, et cetera, is, is, is a little different than that, which is good. But this group here needs to be democratic because you have to do what you believe. I do believe that's a very simple principle that you act what you purport. And uh, if you purport democracy, and I'm very much uh, believe in democracy, then you have to act in it. And this group has not acted democratically in that the uh, program committee and everything that's decided in all the various committees ha- were self-appointed, which is a little bit surprising to me, or uh, maybe not, but that's too much for me to not say anything about it. And, I, and I'm not the kind of person who wouldn't say anything about it. So um, and the other part of it is, well, I, I must say, I think it's good for everybody to get their their information from both sides and not just from Russia it, regarding the Ukraine war. You might want to listen to Amanpour and company, which is a, a, a good reporter who's in Kiev right now. But anyway, um, so that's what I have to say about this group. And I think we need to put you know our principles and actions together. And uh, thank you very much. I guess I'm a third generation communist still in spite of everything. The end. Uh, thank you. The next person is uh, Rich or Kit. You can unmute yourself, please. Hello. Go ahead. We can Hi. Go. This is okay. This is Kit. Uh, thank you very much, Laura, for your presentation. Uh, your talk's given me much more insight, um, and I'm really glad that the uh, Green Party and Peace and Freedom are coming together. I think that's a step forward. Uh, we need to, you know, work more together, uh, and we need to change that primary law that keeps other parties out. I, it's so stark. I work at the county. I walk by the, the uh, uh, registered voters every day. They have a nice big screen that uh, shows 
different issues. And one of them has to do with who, how many people belong to the parties. And it's, it's so sad when I see that the other parties are, are very small in comparison to the Democrats and the Republicans. But of course, the Bay Area and California is dominated by the Democratic Party. Um, now, I, I want to point out that when you were saying that on the ballot, the about the partisan, nonpartisan, uh, in Alameda County, it, it's not correct that those positions are, even though the the positions that people are running for are nonpartisan uh, positions. The party of the candidates are still listed. I don't think that's the case for the city, the local um, uh, positions. Um, and that's on the, the green, um, that's on the voting pamphlet. Um, I have a criticism about the Green Party's pamphlet. I cringe whenever I read it because it, to me, it shows that the Green Party doesn't really know what those positions in the county represent. And I believe they need to talk to people that work for the county to find out what those positions actually do. Um, I've worked for the government, uh, for the county for 27 years. I was too late, but I tried to communicate to the local um, Green Party about what was wrong with the pamphlet. And I just felt like it fell on deaf ears. Um, I don't know what the process is for uh, correcting, making corrections on that. But I mean, I when I uh, supported a particular candidate, it was a somebody who supported Bernie Sanders, and the uh, uh, Green Party went with a Democratic Party candidate who sounded better. But it's anyway, that's that's another issue. Um, the uh, other thing too is that there was a particular candidate that got into the uh, tax collector's office, and he's been, you know, he's a progressive. He was actually appointed by the the um, the board of supervisors. Uh, but his, I mean, it's it's a problem when you get a candidate uh, who doesn't have experience that they really run into a lot of, uh, uh, I guess, uh, blocks to try to get things moving. And so um, he's had to rely on a Democrat, Democratic candidate. So I'm just saying there needs to be, has to be some work uh, between uh, parties, the major party uh, who, you know, if there's somebody open within the Democratic Party, you got to work with those people to help give some kind of insight into how uh, government runs. Uh, and then my other question is, um, Prop 19, I know that's a single issue, but uh, I'd like to get your opinion on that one. Thank you. Remind me what Prop 19 is. Um, it was written by the real estate industry and it was, it took away, well, it, it was promoted as giving more protections for um, not okay. protections. Um, it has to do with Prop 58. It got rid of Prop 58. Right. It, it, it has to do with, and, and there, yeah, okay. And, and it has to do with inheriting. They're, they're calling it the yes. death tax. Right, they're calling it getting rid right. of the death tax, you know, so they're, yeah. they're characterizing estate taxes, you know, using that terminology. Okay, um, so yes, the voter guide, um, the Green Party Voter Guide, which is put out by the Green Party of Alameda County, um, has been very useful for a lot of people. It's imperfect, um, and it's done, you know, as as you know, all volunteer, and um, getting people to, uh, you know, getting a huge bunch of people to write about all of the offices and, and trying to get something out there to be helpful to the voters. And it's not. So it's not perfect. I don't vote exactly according to everything in the Green Party uh, voter guide, but it helps. It helps me with a lot of things. But um, and in in terms of being part of, uh, you know, you can get the. I don't know the. Uh, yeah, it's a process that has to start really early, and so I'm sorry that your feedback didn't get in until later. Um, the death tax, which they're they're calling that, is that they. They want to. I think the Prop 58 got it so that um, uh, so that people would have to 
pay the uh, newly assessed, you know, the current assessed value on their houses once the parents and grandparents have passed, you know, that it that it stops staying at that very low Prop 13 flattened property tax level. Um, and that that whole um, the way that taxes are done in across the country and in California is so bad and needs to be changed so much, but it's basically California. I just, say, there's a measure in, Cali in uh, Oakland that I was collecting some signatures for and, and it's, it's about um, making business taxes progressive rather than a flat rate. Um, and San Francisco and Berkeley already have progressive business taxes, but Oakland doesn't. And so it's about that. Um, and somebody was saying that, that California has some responsibility for the fact that the rich aren't taxed the way they used to, like when Prop 13 was passed in 1978 by Ronald Reagan and his group. And I just was floored, I shouldn't have been, but because in 1978, Jerry Brown, Democrat, had been the governor for three years and it passed under his watch. And when he was governor again for eight years from 2010 to 20, 2000, to, from, from 2010 to 2018, he didn't lift a pinky to do anything about it. Um, but so that was being uh, blamed on Reagan, which was incredible. So this death tax thing that the uh, super right wing billionaires um, started calling estate taxes and got that uh, uh, on all of their literature and in people's mouths and ears and minds. Um, it's so... I mean, the sad thing is that then people who pass along their houses to their children, their children end up having to pay the same rates, property tax rates, as somebody whose parents never owned a home, who are a first time homeowner, a young person, you know? And so, I mean, yeah, that's sad, but it's sad for the people who, who don't have their parents giving them the down payments. You know, it's, it is so hard for somebody who doesn't have the down payment paid for by their um, by their parents who are lucky enough to, you know, to have that happen to even get a place and they're paying top dollar on their property tax rates. And so it's but but it also, you know, I also understand why the people don't want their, you know, why they would want to keep the old low rates. If the billionaires were being taxed the way they should be taxed, and then down, from down there, the multimillionaires and all of that, if they were being taxed the way they should be taxed, we wouldn't be messing with these little things. You know, the, every, people now, I believe, know that in, a lot of people know that in 1961, when Eisenhower left office, the top income tax rate at the federal level for the top layer of your income was 91%. And now it's a whopping 37%. And so that is, and that has caused the billionaires, then they go, gee, where should I put this money? Should I put it in my pocket of which I'm going to keep most of it? Or should I put it to invest in the company or in the pockets of the employees? Gee, I think I'll put it in mine. Whereas they're a little less incentivized to do that if they only keep nine cents of it, you know? And so, so it's, uh, no, the taxes are, are really truly um, horrible. And yeah, <laughs> that's why Tax the Rich is one of my platforms. So. Thank you, Laura. <clears throat> Next in the queue is Susan S. Go ahead, Susan. Susan, you <clears throat> you're still muted. Do you wanna unmute? Oh, thank you. Sorry. Go ahead. Hello, hello Laura. Hello, Susan. Are you still using the term dinosaur parties? I'm, I'm calling them Titanic. Titanic, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I have a question. I, I have a question about the landscape. Um, 
I became aware a while ago that there's a new party that's sweeping the country. It's called the People's Party. It, it was founded by uh, people disappointed with Bernie, who worked for Bernie, but was disappointed um, in his position. So it's to the left of Bernie. And it is seeking ballot status all over the country. And it has acquired ballot status in California. It has or has not? It has. It has, okay. It has. So um, I, I, you don't, you're not aware of that. Okay. I, yeah, I, I didn't, you know, on the spreadsheet that I put the link in the uh, chat for, they're not listed yet. And so I don't know. Um, yeah. Did, did you have more that you wanted to say or was that it? No, I just wanted to let people know that the, the field is becoming more, uh, the, the uh, yeah. small parties are becoming more numerous, which in a way is a, a, a dilution and it, it yeah. reflects, um, et cetera. Right, blah, blah. right. Yeah, no, I have a comment about that. Also a comment I wanted to say about billionaires is that I've started to say, I mean, definitely we need the money Put and, and what, what, what they're doing instead of um, taxing billionaires is that they're taxing the rest of us in the form, not just of taxes, like regressive taxes, sales taxes, parcel taxes, where it's the same amount for any you know, property, uh, no matter the size, uh, and but we're also paying higher tuition. We're paying higher park fees. We're paying more traffic fees, more parking spot fees, you know, all of that, anything but tax the billionaires. And the problem with the billionaires, yes, we need that money. But what we also need is for them not to have that money, which is because there's, they, you cannot buy enough yachts and mansions and parties and islands. What they buy is power. And they buy power in those two entities that I main, mentioned that were trying to kill us off primarily, which is they buy politicians which run pretty cheap relative to the return on investment that the billionaires get. And they buy media, you know, we, where we have six corporations or something owning the vast majority of the media in the country, which never used to be the thing and the regulations changed so that they could do that. But we need to stop people from being able, not just stop them from having their own private space programs, but also buying politicians and buying um, uh, media. And so the People's Party um, Nick Banna, is that his name? Um, that one, one of the things I was going to say is a strength, actually, also, I'm not sure I mentioned this about Green Party and Peace and Freedom, is that there is no, um, no uh, leader, single leader or single figurehead, which actually makes us a little stronger, because if you knock that person off, then you can pr knock off the party. But we don't have single, you know, uh, uh, we don't have oligarchies within, you know, we have power struggles and stuff like that. But we don't, and, and whereas I understand that Nick Banna and his father or something, you know, we're, we're pretty much the leaders and it's like what they say goes. And I think that that has hurt them. I wasn't aware that they're already in California. I know they weren't on that spreadsheet that I just saw, but, um, at first, what they wanted to do, they wanted to have a party that and, and their person was going to be Bernie Sanders, and he uh, rejected the idea. Then what they were going to do was run for a whole bunch of seats in Congress in 2022. And that's this year. I, that was something I, I heard a few years ago, and I don't know whether that's going to happen. And so all I know is that some parties have come and they have gone and they have come and they have come gone. And every time that they come, it, like, it looks like they're going to wipe out the Green Party or Peace and Freedom or whatever. However, we're still here. You know, we're still here. And it's because of our values and because there's enough people to keep it going, you know, to, to, uh, of a commitment to have it. And so um, I imagine that we'll, we'll, uh, we'll keep going. Sorry, sorry, I was muted. Um, next is Raj followed by Norma. Go ahead, Raj. 
Okay, uh, thank you, Laura. I, I have not voted previously in these primaries and elect, I've voted in the election and I'm registered as peace and freedom. So I will be voting for you. So that's from, from that one vote you, you're assured. The problem I have is understanding, no, there's an achievement to stay alive for so many years, but the question is capturing power because there's a tremendous, as you already pointed, a tremendous nexus of big money, big corporate money and politicians of the two parties. And even though Trump looked like he was an outsider, but he really wasn't an outsider, he represented the interests of the capitalist class just as well. I mean, he figured out the language by which he seemed like he was an outsider. And he got funding from right-wing you know, capitalists uh, in, instead of financial capitalists. So the fight against, against this entrenched interest of politician bought out by corporate money is so powerful. I want to understand if you have, and I really admire your positive uh, uh, outlook on, on, on future, uh, that we can get somewhere with the elections. I'm pretty pessimistic about elections getting people the power. And I would like that to be the case, but uh, from what I've heard you from you is very reasonable arguments. But as uh, Richard Fallenbaum pointed out, reasonable arguments don't work out because of all the constraint media, the entrenched interest, the two party blocking you out, et cetera. So where does your optimism come from? I mean, how, how do you see power can be captured by the people so they can make changes. So rather than war and huge profits for the corporation, ordinary people's life can be improved. Okay, okay. Um, the uh, sometimes I just I just jokingly say, don't call me optimistic. I'm, you know, don't accuse me of being optimistic, but. Um, and all the words have, you know, different people like different words. Some people don't like the word hope. I don't like the word optimism. Um, Chris Hedges doesn't like optimism or hope, but he likes faith. Um, you know, but, but it seems like you got to have something. You know, it's like you got to have heart, you know, something. You know, you got something that keeps you going. Just the idea. And I think that um, for me, Every once in a while when I get really frustrated and I think, oh, please, can't I quit, please? And I realize I can't because I, because for one thing, you know, you go for the world, every step you take, every, all these songs are coming to my mind. Every step you take, you're like, you're gonna go toward the world you don't want or toward the world you do want, you know? It's like, a, it's, so we might as well go for toward the world that we do want. And, and some of the benefits to that is that um, well, you're going for what you want. And another benefit for that is that you run into some great people. You know, you run into some really frustrating people too, but you run into some great people who are thinking and it's thought provoking and it's vital, it's engaging, that kind of thing. I, I wouldn't go away from that. But, but in terms of optimism, we've gone so far in so many wrong directions and we're still going in the wrong direction. We haven't even changed directions you know, on the climate and things like that and on military, oh my goodness. Do you know all of these things, it's, it's incredible. But um, we can always make things a little bit better. We can always, I can always open up, you know, undo the isms that have been put in me. You know, I can notice them and get rid of them and you know, all of that, they've been put in all of us. But so here we are. Um, when uh, uh, Richard mentioned about Engels saying that uh, uh, elections don't change anything, um, I'm thinking of uh, of Latin America. You know where they they did. You know they have. It's not the be all and end all how the elections go. It takes a huge people's movement. To, and that's what they had in Latin America. So they had these elections where people were elected president and then, you know, the US one by one tries to pick them off and succeeds, but they're coming back because they were Chavez, you know, like somebody said about Chavez, they said, um, 
people say, somebody a Venezuelan, people say that uh, we all talk like Chavez. And she said, the truth is he talks like us. Do you know that that was his strength? And he said, how do you get people out of poverty? Give them power. You know, it's, it's, it's the, that kind of thing. And so we need to, and in Latin America from what, you know, I've gone there a few times. It's like, they do these very serious things. They have these huge problems they're dealing with and they have music and fun and laughter and dance, you know? It's like their whole, you know, they bring their whole person into it. And so, um, so I, I, while I wouldn't say that I'm um, optimistic, I would say that I don't see that I have any other choice than, and I think I, like there's a whole lot of other people that here that I see that would probably feel the same way, although they might say it a little differently, but that I don't have any other choice, but to keep going for the world that I want. Do you know, I just don't know what else I would do. Um, and so, and it isn't the political parties, by the way, the parties, it, it was um, the movement moved Chavez, moved the political parties and stuff like that. It really is the movement. It's people getting together. And it's su such a conundrum, such a, a how in the world are the people in the U.S. going to like get up and go and just stand together? It's a, don't we wish we had a magic formula for that? So anyway, you got to have something. Thank okay. you, Mark. Um, I'd like to re remind people to put down your hand after you speak. I do see some people who've spoken before and want to speak again. That's cool. Um, uh, the next on the queue is Norma. Go ahead, Norma. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, let's see. Somebody was speaking as though they hadn't really heard Laura say and explain the difficulty of getting ballot access it becomes more difficult every session because the uh, Democrats and Republicans, and I use that as one word, each session decide, oh, I think they've had a little too much access. We'll co it'll cost more. We'll, we'll have to get more signatures to get on the ballot. And this is one barrier after another is raised to keep us uh, from having access. It's not because there's anything wrong with us. Uh, by the way, we are all living in a despotic, totalitarian autocracy. And the sooner we realize that, the sooner we'll start to come together instead of uh, chipping away at a piece here and there, uh, you know, because we will give, we, we will give up, and it's not a matter of optimistic, schmuck, optimistic. It's we're we are this way because we're intelligent, and it is very satisfying to work in ways that we feel we are being intelligent about. And as Laura described it, it's irresistible. We don't have a choice about that. Uh, I, as I told, you know, uh, Nina stole my my line. I, I called myself third generation uh, communist and she took it. It was such a good line. She took it and, and it, it just feels better to do this, to know K-N-O-W what's going on. So uh, as I say, the barriers, we have to recognize that the barriers are going on. Uh, the real estate lobby is the largest lobby in Washington. Isn't that exciting? However, regardless that, half the world has turned in directions that can be called communist going. Half the world, it is the, the Bolshevik revolution has so influenced the world. You know, I run off, I'll say Guatemala and Nicaragua and uh, places here, there, and uh, uh, in the Western Hemisphere. And I realize I don't say the African nations that have studied in a communist direction because I don't know them. One of those reasons is uh, after, the Rev after the Bolshevik Revolution, nations in uh, Africa started working on establishing communist, communist directed governments. And 
boy, the owners, the col uh, colonists ran in there and eradicated out of their mouths and minds to the point where it's very difficult for me. I have to keep looking up the names of the nations that have progressed in a in a communist direction, but it's happening around the world. It's influencing the rest of the world, you know, and, and Jean uh, like, <laughs> likes to tell us, remind us that any place practically, well, he doesn't say it this way, but I'll just say it for the sake of length. Any place that's calling itself socialist is socialist, which is a fine thing. And more and more, that's what's going on. Thank, thank you, Norma. Um, there are a number of people who've spoken before who are on the queue right now. I'm going to call on myself and and also ask if anyone else who hasn't spoken wants to speak, raise your hand. Otherwise, we'll go for a second, a second round, give people a second chance. Let me just say one thing. People can click on their video so that their face can be seen. I wanted it to be an oral. A reminder. Well, oh, thank you. Okay. Um, so I just have a couple of things. Um, Laura, I really appreciate your framing the discussion by saying that it's a good thing, a victory that that the Green Party and Peace and Freedom have survived so long. I sometimes I've tended to discount that. And I agree with you, though, when I stop and think about it, I think that's it is a good thing. Um, you some people may have already heard me say this, but it wasn't until my son was in college that I realized to my shock that he thought that the two party system is in the Constitution. And he thought that because he'd been hearing about it touted by his civics teachers since he was in elementary school. We have a two party system in our country and they tout it as if it is somehow written into the law. Um, and it's really good to remind people that that we that's not true. And on the other hand, of course, as you and Richard and others have suggested, it's only it's from the streets that the power comes, that it doesn't come directly from power of a party does not come directly from uh, top down from its leadership or the minds of its leadership or whatever. It, that I think that the struggle for a, a different candidate, a socialist candidate, at whatever level we're talking about, the power of that comes from the power of the people's movement, which at the moment is not very strong in this country, but um, we, we still have to keep building it. And um, another thing I'm reminded of is that this week I got a mailing, an email blast from the Ella Baker Center, which is a local political institution. And they uh, quoted Ella Baker, who said, all those, those who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. So forget optimism, forget, we just can't rest, period. And we have to keep going and we have to talk to each other about what's the best way to go, what's the path that we need because the strategic view of our struggle because it's not easy to determine. Um, so, now I'll uh, let me say who's on the queue for the second round, since I don't see anyone else who hasn't spoken. Um, so Yusuf, followed by Susan or Michael, um, Richard W. and Jean. Yusuf, go ahead, please. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, uh, uh, now let me say that. Even if I sometimes disagree with the uh, sort of tactics uh, of the uh, Green Party, uh, there is no doubt in my mind that it is part of the left. It's working class and people oriented. Uh, however, uh, I can't, this is going to be off topic for California, certainly. Uh, I can't say that for the uh, German Das Grünen, uh, 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 the Green Party of Germany, which seems to be uh, to the right of the already uh, quite uh, right-wing uh, Social Democrats and uh, uh, had taken a, uh, sometimes I think, um, a, a neoliberal stance. Uh, the, it, I think it, it started out as a uh, uh, 
um, as a uh, left alternative, uh, but uh, it, it certainly uh, in the last few decades it is not. Uh, I've heard this uh, following from what I do follow from German politics. Uh, those who, uh, friends and comrades who have been there. Uh, so uh, I wonder if you have any, uh, made any evaluation of the German uh, Green Party. Um, I, I can just say that I don't know a lot about them, but but I did tell that one story about how they voted, um, how they affected the government in terms of nuclear power. And my um, impression, again, I don't know that much about all the international Green Parties, but from this and that, is that sometimes I think that really their strongest positive value really is the environment and that sometimes they fall down on the others, which are very important, which is justice, social justice and peace. And I know that um, at some point way back when, maybe it was Iraq, that the Green Party in coalition, you know, it's like went along with the U.S. invasion of, of Iraq in some way that, that was sort of horrifying. But it's when they get, you know, there's real politic and what are they, there's something else that they, the more ideal. Um, and so sometimes they figure, hey, you know, it's not going to make any difference if we go this way or that way on this, but it will get us some points going the other, other direction. But um, my, my preference, you know, it's one thing when you're in office, but it's another thing, you know, it's to, is that they all are interrelated. You can't have peace in a good environment. You can't have a good environment without peace and without justice. You can't have justice without peace and without a good environment. You know, those kinds of things go together and democracy undergirds the whole thing or upsets the whole thing. So I, that's it for that. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael, you're next. Thank you, Sharon. And thank you, Laura, for a very interesting discussion. Um, we've mentioned several parties here, but one party has not been mentioned, and that's the Working Families Party, which has developed uh, largely back east and has, is gaining uh, power, uh, perhaps not elected power, although I believe in New York there are elected Working Family Party people and maybe in a couple of other of the Eastern or Midwest states. Anyways, here in California, there is a Working Families Party. Uh, they've uh, had big meetings and small meetings. And I'm wondering whether the Green Party or the Peace and Freedom Party has any relationship with the Working Families Party in California. That's my question. Thanks. So the very short answer is, from what I know, um, no. <laughs> I don't know of the Green Party having a relationship with them, but I don't know every relationship that Greens have. Um, and it was mentioned earlier, actually, in connection with uh, Connecticut, um, that it's there. I think, was it Yusuf? Um, yeah. Yeah, that... Yeah, it, it was mentioned. And I know that one of the dangers of any political entity is being subsumed, being um, sort of uh, brought into the fold of the Democratic Party and then losing um, some of the power that they could otherwise have for, toward a better world, my opinion. Okay, um, we, ha we have um, a couple people still in the queue and um, we are over time right now. We usually end at this time and then leave the discussion open for a more informal. Um, I think I did call, I did say that Richard W and Eugene were in the queue. So I'm gonna let those two people speak and then we'll, we'll turn off the recording and we'll have a more free and open discussion. And Norma, you'll be the first on that queue. Go ahead, Richard. Thank you again. Ah, so I have a couple of, um, I guess, organizing questions. 
Uh, and something I want to follow up on what um, uh, along the lines of what Raj uh, mentioned. Uh, one one question, and both of these, by the way, I, I've had long running discussions in my labor union about this because they are very much an adjunct to the Democratic Party. Uh, so my one question is, is, is how are you handling uh, the independent vote and the non-voting people? Uh, because I think uh, roughly 40% of all those who register don't vote. And uh, I, I'm pretty sure the Democratic Party is just sort of blowing those people off. Uh, the second question I have is, um, how are, 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 you, are you modifying your organizing model in the face of new technology? In other words, uh, I've always thought that you, we, should, we should bring technology in conjunction with uh, Dolores Huerta's um, uh, house meetings. I'm not sure how, but I've always sort of leaned in that direction. The, um, the third question I have is, and it sort of follows up to what Raj was talking about, is uh, if elected, uh, your relations, you're going to have to have relations with other uh, non-Green Party or non-third party um, um, uh, people. And my question, I guess, is, how do you see that uh, fo uh, 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 rolling out? How do you see your relations with, uh, with traditional Republicans, if you will, uh, you know, if you, if you win? Thanks. Just uh, quickly, um, I think the question of how to get 40% to don't vote, um, to me, again, as, as I said before, use all your power. It's a relatively small amount of time and energy to vote, so vote, you know, and I, but it's the same question as how are we gonna get this huge people's movement? It's like, how do you get people to move, to act, to, you know, to react, you know, engage. Um, so to me, it's a similar kind of a question. It's very uh, difficult. Um, People have often try and they, they think that all of these people are gonna vote and then they end up not voting. Um, how do you do it? I don't know. Um, organizing, so a lot of things are, are, you know, in the pandemic, it changes everything. And so it's even more virtual than ever with the pandemic because people aren't meeting in person. And so we're not having host meetings, you know, Zoom meetings and things like that. But I think that sometimes in the back of my mind, I think, you know what, I think it really is gonna be that a whole bunch of people are just gonna to have to go door to door to door to door. And it's, it seems, you know, almost unconfrontable, but it probably is one-on-one on one-on-one. On one on one. And um, the third thing, if I were elected, and then I think the fact that I'm uh, not so much oriented toward attack might help, you know, but um, I've, uh, I think that what, what, if I were elected, you know, it's like anyone can win the lottery, you know, I could win the controller's race. That's the way the system is set up. Um, if I were elected, I would immediately start finding the there there are people there whose whose whatever hearts are in the right place, you know, start connecting with them and just start uh, building from that and start doing audits, audit, 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 audit what happened to the education system, what happened to health care where they had everything they needed to vote that in earlier this year and didn't do it. You know, just follow the money, do, do those kinds of major audits, not just the little financial audits of the agencies and stuff like that, but find some people who are interested in those questions and have them do it. I've, I've managed um, groups of people before, not hundreds like it would be in the controller, but it, um, but I think that whatever experience I've had would help a little. Okay, thank you. We're gonna give Jean the last word on the recording and then we'll have our more free, free for all discussion. Go ahead, Jean. Okay, we, we should probably get, have Laura give the absolute last word. Oh, okay, oh, right. Laura gets the absolute last word. Okay, great. Well, I had a couple things to say. First of all, I do get fund appeals from the working parties working families party. So they do exist here in California. Um, secondly, I just wanna, I have the story about when I had a tour of Cuba 
And one of, uh, we we're going around, one of the North Americans asked uh, the question, well, how can you say you're a democracy when you only have one political party? <clears throat> Their response was, under Batista, we had seven political parties and no democracy. Now we have one political party and we have democracy. So I think that's something to bear in mind uh, and remind you that uh, the Chinese Communist Party came to, came to power uh, with, with uh, you know, by organizing the peasants and won a military victory. But the first thing they did after that, it took them four years, but they organized elections to legitimate their uh, power. Um, and the last thing I just want to say, I had a very transforming discussion with uh, Dorothy Healy, who was formerly the Southern California chair of the Communist Party during the McCarthy period. And we had a very interesting discussion. She was a tough old bird, let me say that. Uh, but I didn't necessarily agree with her on everything. And one of the things I said is, I just don't want to work with Democrats because they were so slimy. And her response to that was, honey, you're not there to get a date or for, for social connections. You're there because that's where the power is and communists need to be where the power is. So I'll just uh, leave it at that and uh, pass it on to uh, Laura. And again, thank you for this discussion. Well, Laura. Okay, thank you. And I, 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 I don't know how I would exactly wrap this up other than to put out a call for um, people to participate in the uh, June, in the primaries. And I know that this is not, not everybody's in California, but to, to, again, as I've said, maybe two or three times, we need to use all the power that we've got. It is about power. Um, and um, power is a good thing when it's when it's used for for good purposes. Uh, and so use the power that we've got. Just I think day by day, look for um, the ways that we can spend our money. How we I follow the money. How 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 the money is spent shows where the values are, which means that this country is military. You know, that's where that's what the value is. Um, but where we spend our money, how we spend our time, what um, and do vote. Thank you, Raj, for your in advance for your vote. You know, but do vote in the primaries, in the um, in the generals, in the whatever. And um, every chance you get, vote non-corporate. Every chance you get, go against the corporations. Um, and when there's a chance to get together in, and when there are rallies, I remember there was a May Day rally in San Francisco. This was be when people thought the pandemic was winding down, you know. Um, but there were, uh, went to a rally in San Francisco and it, I was just as happy as I could be just standing there watching people go by, you know, group after group after group after group. Sometimes people say rallies don't help. They say elections don't help. They say this doesn't help and that doesn't help. I say it all helps, you know, just a little bit. Um, but, and some people say, well, yeah, a rally or a march, you know, it's a time to get together with your friends, you know, but it doesn't really do anything. Well, getting together with your friends is something, you know, getting together and feeling that that energy and going along. And so, so I would just say, and I'm not optimistic, but it's like, I want a good life and I want a good life, not just for me, but for my, uh, my daughter and everybody else's kids and everybody else's grandparents and, and everybody and, and all. And, um, oh, I'm going to do, I'm going to end it with this one thing. I'm going to recommend, as I've recommended a bunch of times, pick out uh, some books by Rutger Bregman. Um, he did Utopia for Realists. He's a young Dutch historian, Utopia for Realists, about universal basic income, actual examples, 15-hour work week, open borders, actual examples. 
Then he followed it up with humankind, where he realized that people thought people were basically bad. And he was saying, most people are basically decent. And he undoes, I just put this in my blog, so this is repetition for some of you. But um, he undoes things like Kitty Genovese and Lord of the Flies and the Milgram experience and the Stanford prison experiments and talks about how people really are. And so, so somehow we have to wake up of this sleeping giant of the United States. And um, so all power to the people, hasta la victoria siempre. Otro mundo es posible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. Institute for the Critical Study of Society at the Niebuhr Proctor Marxist Library receives no corporate funding, nor do we have any paid staff. We rely on the support of working class folks that share our commitment to the socialist legacy of Karl Marx. We continue to need funds to meet necessary expenses. Since we can no longer pass the hat at our in-person forums, Please send contributions to our treasurer, either online via PayPal or by check. The PayPal ID is ICSS Sunday, S-U-N-D-A-Y, at yahoo.com. And the name is Richard Fallenbaum. And checks may be made out to Richard Fallenbaum and sent to him at 1225 Nielsen Street, Berkeley, California, 94706. Fallenbaum is spelled F-A-L-L-E-N-B-A-U-M. To donate directly to the Marxist Library, send a check to the Nebro Proctor Marxist Library at 6501 Telegraph Avenue, Oakland, California, 94609 or directly or donate online at www.paypal.me slash npml. Info for information, write to, to npml at marxistlibr.org. And the website is marxistlibr.org. Don't worry.